Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kriam Butler, and I'm the director of the Global Economy and Finance Program at Chatham House. Uh, and I'm truly delighted to be moderating our next session in the Chatham House Global Trade Conference, uh, which is a keynote address by the Right Honorable Kemi Badenoch, uh, Secretary of State at the Department of Business and Trade and Minister for Women and Equalities. Uh, the Secretary of State has one of the most important roles in the UK cabinet, covering key aspects of the UK's external and domestic economic policies at a time when global trade and investment is more important than ever to the UK following our departure from the EU, but it's also under substantial threat. The Secretary of State will give an initial address uh, and then will join me for a discussion and a Q&A with the audience. So Secretary of State, thank you for sparing the time for being with us today. I know you have in this audience a lot of people with enormous interests, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. To understand the role of the UK in the global trade landscape, we must describe what that landscape looks like right now. Everyone in this room is old enough, at least I think everyone in this room is old enough, uh, to have seen for themselves the transformational power of trade. You don't have to go as far back as Adam Smith or David Ricardo to understand the arguments. Look to Eastern Europe and what's happened since the fall of the Berlin Wall or to countries in the Indo-Pacific, like Malaysia, or even China. As free trade has grown, it is no coincidence that more than a billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty over the same period. But I'm not here to give you a cliche-ridden lecture on how great trade is. The case for it is overwhelming. Yet, despite that, it has become a tough sell for politicians. I'm here to respond to the criticisms that the UK no longer has a place in the world and that free trade has been part of the problem rather than the solution. I'm here to give you reasons for optimism and reasons to be proud about our role on the world stage. Across the West and beyond, low growth has become a profound and stubborn problem. In many countries, wages have failed to keep pace with rising prices, with lower and middle income families being hardest hit. Many, as you know, blame free trade. They say we've allowed other countries to steal our lunch, that the momentum is now with others like the BRICS nations. One of the biggest challenges for those of us on the center right is that many of the arguments we believe, in fact know to be correct, are counterintuitive. In trade negotiations, I am, offering count I am often countering the belief that trade is a zero sum game, that if we gain from someone, we must lose something in exchange. Proving that trade within a free market provides mutual benefit is hard when your counterparty believes that the objective is to try and take something from you. I spent all of last week in Abu Dhabi at the World Trade Organization's 13th Ministerial Conference. This is where the rules-based trading system and democracy come together to have a big row. I'm still baffled at how 164 countries make any decisions at all, given the need for unanimity. I saw a lot of arguments. I also saw some tears. But the disagreements in Abu Dhabi were not between countries, which were pro-Israel or pro-Palestine, not even really between developed and developing nations. The principal disagreements were often within the BRICS nations, between those who support free trade and those who don't. So it's a choice between the agenda which the head of the WTO, Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wela, is promoting, a forward-looking agenda that is about services, green, digital and inclusive trade, and an alternative protectionist agenda ending up as a race to the bottom. The rules-based system, which you often hear about, is under threat. One country can stop 163 others from coming to a decision. The role of the UK here is not just to prevent the WTO from being held back by a small minority, but to ensure that it can live up to its founding principles, using free trade as a means to raise living standards, create jobs, and improve people's lives, something which we have championed right from the very beginning. When I became the Secretary of State for Business and Trade, I told my team that our mission was to be the department for economic growth. 
and I set five priorities to establish how we would deliver on that promise with an outward-looking international agenda. To remove our, uh, market access barriers for UK businesses was the first. Second, to grow British exports. Third, to become the number one destination for investment in Europe. Fourth, to sign high-quality trade deals. And finally, and I think most importantly, to defend free and fair trade. These priorities exist in a world where protectionism peaked. Just as, just as we embarked on our own independent trade policy, we took our own seat at the WTO, just as many had lost faith in the institution and lost faith in the value of free trade. We were repeatedly told that without the clout of the EU bloc, we would not open up trade with the markets of the future. And three myths have arisen, which are regularly repeated on growth, exports, and investment. The first is that Brexit has hampered our growth relative to comparable economies. That is not the case. The IMF predicts that between 2024 to 2028, the UK will outgrow the G7 economies of France, Germany, Italy, and Japan. And our economy is expected to be 17% larger than France's by 2035. The second is that exports have declined. That is also not the case. The value of our exports in 2016, the year of the referendum, was 576 billion. In 2020, the year we left the EU, it was just over 624 billion, that's uh, including the impacts of COVID. And today, our exports are worth over 850 billion pounds. That is still despite the challenges that we're experiencing following COVID and Putin's war in Ukraine. The third claim was that after Brexit, investment would dry up. However, last year, our car sector alone attracted £23.7 billion in investment commitments, more than the past seven years combined. The UK's car production is now growing at its fastest rate since 2010, and the latest figures show that we are the number one destination in Europe for foreign direct investment. So, we have succeeded, not in spite of embracing free trade, but because of it. In just a few years, we've negotiated more free trade agreements than any other independent country in the world. In the coming weeks, we will pass our bill for CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. This will make over 99% make, uh, over of UK goods eligible for zero tariffs in Asia-Pacific member countries, a region that will drive global growth over the next few decades. Of course, it is easy to produce statistics showing that exports and investment are up. It is a lot harder to demonstrate how we are defending the system that we helped create. I tell my department we should start by not being knowingly naive. By that, I mean not blindly believing that just because rules are written, they will be followed, or that culture and politics are not relevant and it's only the regulations that count. It's about realism. Realism, realism, realism. Which brings me to the criticisms that the government typically faces on trade. When the US brought in the Inflation Reduction Act, there were many calls for the UK to do the same. Lots of articles written about how leaving the EU meant we were already in decline. My response was that copying and pasting policy from other countries is not a strategy. It is not possible for every economy to subsidize its way to growth. Some will go bankrupt doing that. That will not be us. At a time when other countries are engaging in subsidy wars, we need to be smart and work with those allies who understand what is at risk. We have to be pragmatic. Yes, that means offering targeted support to tackle specific issues facing our economy. And yes, we want a level playing field for our entrepreneurs so they can compete globally. But, but doesn't mean hosing industries down with subsidies or slapping tariffs on products from abroad. Trade wars inevitably fan the flames of global tensions, the very last thing we need right now. This wouldn't be a Kemi Badenoch speech without a reference to my favorite economist, Thomas Sowell, who pointed out that trade wars are economically counterproductive. He argues, for example, that the Smoot-Hawley tariffs play just as great a role in prolonging the Great Depression as the Wall Street crash itself. I agree. We would be wise to heed his advice because history shows that countries who engage in protectionism and in beggar thy neighbor trade policies are always weaker and poorer as a result. So we lead by example, we work with allies, we are not alone. 
countries like New Zealand, Japan, Switzerland, Singapore, and many others are with us. At a Chatham House event just a few months ago, the Labour Shadow Foreign Secretary made the claim that the UK is isolated and disconnected. This is so far-fetched as to be laughable. He said we needed to be pragmatic, which I agree with, but talking about pragmatism without any realism is naive. The Labour Party is naive because they are not realistic. They are unfamiliar with the concept of trade-offs. We Conservatives are well aware that to govern is to choose and every choice comes with an opportunity cost. So in my department, I have to grapple with maintaining a competitive UK steel industry that can stand on its own two feet against the global oversupply of steel as China floods the market, while also ensuring vital safeguards for the domestic sector. Not easy, that's a trade-off. I have to manage the lowering of tariffs to bring down costs while not undercutting our own producers as other countries subsidize theirs. Not easy, there is a trade-off. I have to strike the right balance between embracing the import of goods from developing countries to help them grow with the need to maintain the high standards on quality and safety, which the British people rightly expect. We make choices. Our free trade agreements are helping us make the right choices because they're all about diversification and resilience. That is what the Indo-Pacific tilt is about. But we need to make sure that the facts are out there. It still baffles me how desperate people are to blame everything on leaving the EU. Labour's criticisms of our FTAs are often because it's the first time many are watching the ins and outs of an independent trade policy played out live. These events took place in the black box when we were in the EU. We didn't have the blow-by-blow -blow updates of what was happening with negotiations as we do now. It is new, and for those of us who are optimists, exciting. For those of us who are pessimists, scary. I want to make it all go away. The problems that they see now we had when we were in the EU, like harmonizing standards and regulations across different trade agreements, or engaging with countries that have exceptionally different and diverse models of trade, or striking deals with countries that don't have our values of democracy, the rule of law, and a market economy. But when we encounter these same standard negotiating issues, it's put down to the UK being isolated or being in decline. That is not a serious analysis of trade for the 21st century. It is not serious commentary. Let's have more realism. The reality is that the geopolitical climate and the global conditions for economic security are more precarious now than at any other time since the Cold War. In the Middle East, conflict is raging. In the Red Sea, the free flow of trade is under attack, which is why, together with our allies, we have taken coordinated military action to protect it. COVID and Putin's war against Ukraine have permanently reconfigured supply chains. The challenges in trade that we face are different from just a few decades ago. We live in a vastly more interconnected global economy with complex supply chains, cheaper international travel and the free flow of information. That inter interdependence means that there can be no retreat into splendid isolation. We must continue to pursue free trade and avoid the tariffs and taxes which stifle growth and push up inflation. That open, outward-looking approach is compatible with protecting our long-term economic security. We need investors to feel confident in the UK, confident not only that their assets will grow over time, but that fraud or illicit finance will never be tolerated. Through our Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act, we will make the UK one of the safest places in the world to do business. Our National Security and Investment Act is preventing the hostile acquisition of assets. This matters because our power plants, our 5G networks, and our critical national infrastructure should never be in the hands of those who would do us harm. And we are taking similar precautions with regards to exports leaving the UK, updating our strategic export licensing criteria and significantly enhancing our military end use control. A key aim in all of this work is to prevent hostile countries from ever acquiring British weapons or advanced British technology. And to those who would do harm, to us or to our allies, we say, we will not allow you to use your economic might to meddle with another state's affairs. The vision of Global Britain remains. Once mocked as a nation of shopkeepers, we know the value of trade and are staying true to our heritage as a global trading nation 
that once ruled the waves. We received a great inheritance from previous generations. It is important that we create an even greater one to hand down to the next. So the next time you're asked what role the UK is playing, you can say that from sanctions to supply chain resilience, we are a global leader in economic security and we are defending free and fair trade underpinned by a rules-based system. As you saw in the budget yesterday, we are doing all of this with economic growth at the forefront of our minds. And I will conclude by saying we have a Prime Minister who is clear-eyed about the opportunities and the challenges that lie ahead. Where investor confidence in many countries has been shaken, he has sent a loud and clear message that Britain is open for business. Where there is instability as abroad, he has helped to intervene to bring economic stability at home. He has a plan. And where countries are embracing protectionism, we are opening up our markets and lowering the barriers to free open trade, reducing costs and widening choice for the British consumer, ensuring that our economy is strong, resilient and protected from states that threaten us, threaten our allies and threaten our international security interests. That is the role the UK is playing on the global stage. Thank you. Secretary of, Secretary of State, thank you very much. There's an enormous amount in, in there, and we've only got, I think, about 12 minutes or so for questions. But let, let me kick off, particularly because we're just coming in the aftermath of MC13. You made a very powerful case for the UK to continue fighting for free trade and open markets and so on. And you also highlighted the differences among emerging economies. Um, but we know, you know, in a sense, that President Biden has continued a number of the policies from his predecessor, and if uh, Donald Trump were to win again, we could be in a new phase of, you know, 10% tariffs on, quote, all countries, 60% tariffs on China, and so on. So there is an enormous amount at stake here. You've also highlighted the importance for realism in our approach. And so my, my question really is, uh, the WTO, from its foundation, was mm. focused on liberalization, ever greater liberalization. Isn't it now time, in a sense, if not because of our own beliefs, if only because of getting, if you like, a kind of consensus to reframe what the WTO is for? Mm -hmm. um, is there a case for that? Or would you say, no, we shouldn't go down that route? There is a case for that. Uh, even the Director General will tell you that the WTO needs reform. But it is stuck uh, in a, a bit of a quagmire because of the need for unanimity. Rules uh, around unanimous member consent work very well when there's just 30 of you and all you're talking about is tariffs uh, and, uh, and free flow of goods. It's a lot different when there's 164. It's a lot different when you're talking about climate change and who pays and the environment and digital trade, services trade, which really wasn't a factor if we go back to, uh, to GATT, uh, let alone, or to 1994 even. So those are the things which need looking at. Uh, the biggest issue at WTO at the moment is dis dispute settlement. The uh, US has effectively walked away. So there is nowhere to appeal to because uh, it, it's not playing ball in, in the system. These are all things that need looking at. And I think we as the UK can play a role because we're actually uh, not in the middle of many of the biggest disputes which are taking place. A lot of the disputes around agriculture and public stock holding and so on, uh, they would not have the same sort of impact uh, on the UK as they would have, say, with countries like Brazil or India. So we're in a good place to help broker, uh, to help broker improvements, and that's certainly the role that we are taking um, at the WTO. Thank you very much. So in a sense, it depends on the quality of our ideas um, yes. and the diplomacy and so on with which we push them forward. Another key aspect of our trade policy, as you highlighted, is the bilateral free trade agreements and plurilateral agreements. Um, and in a sense, the bigger they get, the harder they are. Now, yes. CPTPP is a really important one. It doesn't do very much for our GDP as it is now. It might do more in the future. India is proving very hard. Uh, the US, perhaps at some point in the future, is all equally hard. So my question is, if there are these formal legally based trade agreements, but there are also other things. I mean, like the Atlantic Declaration, the US is pursuing um, the Indo-Pacific uh, Economic Cooperation Agreements and so on, which are sort of less, less formal, mm -hmm. um, but within which you can put various things, economic security, agreements on energy, technology, and so on. 
How do you see the balance between these two types of approaches? And do you think we need to put more effort in the future into those informal agreements, or should we continue to major on, on if you like, the formal legal agreements? Well, they're doing, they're doing, doing two different things. And uh, many people who've heard me give speeches on trade would have heard my motorway analogy, that free trade agreements are just the motorway, it's the export and investments, how you use that road uh, mm -hmm. that really make the difference. So signing an FTA in and of itself is not what, going to, uh, is, not what is going to create the, the GDP. And the modeling that we do actually doesn't really capture what happens. We've already seen with the uh, Australia FTA that we're seeing huge increases uh, in exports going there, there's huge increases in trade. It's very, very hard. Uh, it's very, very hard to measure. But focusing on the utilization, ensuring that people understand what those benefits are, take advantage of them, is what will deliver that GDP uh, growth with CPTPP in particular. Because of the, the region and because of the fact that it's likely to grow, mm -hmm. there are so many opportunities that are there. The informal agreements which you've described, uh, you know, the Atlantic Declaration or even the MOUs are doing something, something different. And if I, if I, it, it's really funny, when I post a message on Twitter about, yeah, I signed this MOU, all of the uh, comments underneath are how terrible it is, or it's rubbish, it's not real, this is a fake picture. There's so many people who are out there who just want to tear down what's happening, but they're doing something different. If you have a good relationship with another country, not everything needs to be underpinned by a legal agreement. There are lots of things that we just want to get on and do. Uh, relying on legal agreements alone uh, is, it's very, very slow. It's very painful. You need lots of parliamentary approval uh, in both countries for things that are actually routine, really about market access barrier uh, removal and so on. So there is a place for the MOUs. They can be very sector spe specific. We want to do something on trade that's going to lift uh, a particular sector. And with uh, the Atlantic Declaration, for instance, that's solving a problem around critical minerals at a time when it looks like China's pretty much got the market sewn up. How do we, uh, countries in the West, the countries who are allied, make sure that as we've made a commitment uh, to net zero to use electric vehicles, for example, we haven't locked ourselves out of the market for the components and the critical minerals that we will need in order to, to build those. The, 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 those are the sorts of tensions that we, we have to deal with. And I see just an, the, the, you know, the, an ignorance of those tensions or just a belief that they can be wished away so often. That is what I find frustrating. With steel, for example, I have the same people who say we've got to cut carbon emissions, we change the biggest single carbon emitter to electric arc furnaces, and they complain that jobs have disappeared. Change inevitably will involve those sorts of things. We have to be realistic about all of the big decisions they make and what the trade-offs are going to be, what the costs are, and make decisions with a proper plan in mind. Thank you very much. Right, let's take some questions from the audience. We've got uh, about six minutes, and I want to take um, very quickly uh, perhaps two or three questions from a spread in the audience. So if I could go to the lady here first, uh, in the middle. Please make it a very punchy short Hi. question. Thank um, you. Emily Lidgate from UK Trade Policy Observatory. Just a quick one. I was curious if you could reflect on the UK's decision not to join the MPIA and what's behind that. Thank you. We'll take one over from over there. Thanks. Alistair Smart from Reuters. Uh, Creon mentioned that negotiations with India are difficult. I was just wondering, you haven't been giving a running commentary, but as the Indian elections approach, is there any chance of a free trade agreement with India before the election? Thanks very much. And the lady here. Hi, uh, Ruth Bergen from Transform Trade. So in your top five priorities for your department, climate change wasn't mentioned, and you didn't mention it in your speech either. So I'm wondering if you could tell us what your vision might be for a trade policy that's aligned with our climate ambitions. Very good. So I'll start with MPIA. Yes, please. Uh, no, we haven't joined the MPIA because we are still committed to the dispute settlement um, uh, reform issue at the WTO. We are considering it, so it's not a hard no. It's a not right now. Uh, we'll, we'll keep thinking about it. In my view, MPIA almost seems like uh, diverting away from what the WTO originally uh, had 
and I think that we need to resolve the issues around the appellate body. Obviously, the US is not joining MPIA, but a lot of our other allies uh, like Canada, like Japan uh, have. So it's actively under consideration. But getting that dispute settlement system working properly is the end goal. Yes, there might be other things we can do uh, in the interim, but uh, th th that is the objective and that's why I've taken that decision. On India, yes, it's true. The bigger uh, the country, the more complex uh, the, the trade agreement, and also the, the more different the economy is, the harder it is to negotiate. The EU has been negotiating with India since 2013 and it hasn't finished. There was an announcement that they'd finished their uh, trade negotiations with EFTA and then it turned out that they hadn't. It is because India is still very protectionist where we are very, very liberalized. And uh, in that list that I gave, I said signing high quality trade deals. So I'm not interested in just taking a picture and moving on. It has to be something that is commercially meaningful. People need to be able to say, ah, now I can do this, like we had with our Australia uh, agreements or, or the ones with Japan, for example. We are trying to uh, pull trade towards services. There's just not very much being done on services, on digital trade, and these are very novel areas that a lot of countries are unfamiliar with. They just want to do goods. But our economy is only about 20% goods. We're really services-based. So trying to uh, do something that's going to make sense for the UK as it is in 2024, not 1984 or 1954, is challenging. We can actually sign an agreement before the Indian elections. I suspect that that is not necessarily going to be the case because I don't want to use any election as a deadline. It is possible that that will be, uh, that that will be done. But I'm very resistant to deadlines being set on trade negotiations because it runs down, the, runs down the clock. So it is very possible that we can sign, but I'm not using it as a deadline for the work that, uh, for the work that I'm carrying out, basically. And on climate change, uh, uh, the lady there asked why it wasn't one of my five priorities. The answer is not everything can be a priority for everybody. And if we all have the same, uh, if we all have the same priority, then actually we may not be doing exactly what it is that we need to achieve our objectives. I have said that I want my department to be the department for economic growth. So if I say that uh, I want to sign high quality trade deals, that of course might mean bringing in uh, climate requirements or environmental protections in there to make sure that it is, uh, that it is high quality. But what I'm not going to do is a tick box uh, for people to test me on whether or not I have a commitment. I don't work for Just Stop Oil. I work for the British, um, I work for the British electorate and I need to make sure that my task is delivering what uh, we need right now. The immediate problem we have, I'm afraid, is economic growth. We have low growth, our population is increasing, people are getting poorer. Uh, as a department for business and trade, the growth is my priority. There is a department for energy security and net zero. They, of course, will have that in their priorities. We will work together. But what I don't do is just have a tick list of things which people think should be what my priority should be. I look at what the problem I'm trying to solve is and then work backwards with the plan. But just to follow, carbon border adjustment mechanisms mm. will yes. be a big issue for you. They will be. And, <laughs> uh, you know, they will be, they could be potentially growth enhancing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in a way, it's almost inevitable. So can, just very briefly, I mean, what's your view on on that as an instrument of, of trade or how it's so, going to affect your overall strategy. I think it's going to be very challenging. We had a lot of debates about this at WTO because developing countries in particular see this as a protectionist measure. They don't see it as an environmental measure. We can talk about carbon border uh, adjustment mechanisms as helping to tackle uh, carbon leakage as much as we like. All they hear is, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, we, you know, we're not interested in, in d dealing with you and we're going to, uh, to put up borders. So we have to make sure that our arguments uh, make sense. Uh, the EU is planning to introduce a carbon border adjustment mechanism. The US hates it, Japan hates it, so we're also going to be caught between uh, many of our allies and the countries that we trade with the most. We haven't said, uh, we haven't said no to an adjustment mechanism, but it has to be one. I said this in the House just this morning at our uh, departmental questions. It has to be one that works for the UK rather than just copying and pasting what the EU is doing. The whole purpose of leaving the European Union was to do things with UK, uh, you know, with just UK requirements in mind first. And that uh, is what should happen uh, if we do design a carbon border adjustment mechanism, that's what it should look like. Thank you. Well, Secretary of State, I mean, there's an awful lot more we would like to ask you, but unfortunately, we're out of time. So uh, I'd be grateful if the audience could join me in thanking the Secretary of State for spreading the time.